uh, after the t so called tech bubble in the 1990s, where you had all these dot com uh, stocks that went to astronomical uh, heights and completely irrational valuations, um, the stock market declined 50%. So stock investors were not bailed out. And even if there, and there were a couple of instances when investors were, were rescued, but there were only a few of them. It was Mexico had a debt crisis in 1994, and foreign investors were rescued then. But even considering these, it was impossible for anybody to know in 2007 and 2008 who was going to be rescued and under what terms. And if you actually look at the, re the record, the truth is that most of these institutions were not rescued in, this, in, this, in the sense that I said earlier. That is, the institutions may have been preserved. Bear Stearns, an investment bank, was purchased by J.P. Morgan Chase, merged into J.P. Morgan Chase. But at almost, it was $10 a share, ultimately. So the shareholders lost almost all their money, and the, and the, and the officers in the company lost their jobs. And since most of them were invested in the company, they lost a large chunk of wealth. And you can go down the list. There just wasn't all that much rescue of, of, of investors. I guess this is the uh, formula that says there can be such a thing as too much optimism within. Well, my theory of the, of the financial crisis, which is, I have to say, uh, sadly, is not the mainstream theory, and it seems to be embraced by very few people except me, <laughs> is that we went through an old-fashioned boom and bust. And sort of building on uh, my book, The Great Inflation, uh, I argue that the decline of inflation in the early 1980s really triggered a 25-year economic boom, during which there were only two very modest recessions in 1990-91 and in 2001. Uh, in which the stock market's value increased more than tenfold, in which housing prices began to rise substantially. And the reason for all this was that as inflation came down in the 80s and the, and the 90s, interest rates declined enormously. So at the beginning uh, of the 80s, if you want to take out a home mortgage, you have to pay 15, 16 percent for a 30-year mortgage. By the end of the 90s, that rate was 6 percent. It's now even lower. Um, and so as interest rates came down, people could afford to pay more for their houses. And so housing prices went up. As interest rates came down, people took money out of bonds, put them in the stock market, and so you got this huge stock market uh, boom. And as people felt wealthier because their houses, housing values, and their stock portfolios were going up, they spent more. So we had a consumption boom. And so for 25 years, we had this enormous economic expansion and people began to take it for granted. We would have recessions every once in a while, and we might have uh, problems in the financial markets. But the assumption that accompanied this was that the Federal Reserve and other the Federal Reserve is a so-called central bank created by the government to help manage the economy. That the Federal Reserve could take care of major crises and avoid them, and that uh, other central banks and other parts of the developed world could do the same thing. So economists call this episode, this 25-year, the great moderation, because we no longer had really severe recessions that had occurred to some extent earlier in the post-World War II period and certainly had occurred before World War II. Any notable uh, canaries in the mine shaft that you can remember now looking back with a chance to uh, well, reread the record? You know, there were, there were a few economists who were worried. Uh, Nuriel Rubini has since become very famous for saying we are in for a lot of trouble. There were a few economists at the Bank for Interma International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, who said what we're getting here is an old-fashioned financial uh, inflation of financial assets, stocks and, and bonds, and it won't last. It's going to collapse, and we need to be careful about this. Warren Buffett, although he did not see the housing crisis coming and, in fact, invested in Moody's, which to some extent has been blamed, it's a rating agency, and they rated a lot of these, these securities. So uh, Buffett invested in this company, uh, but he did uh, warn about the dangers of financial derivatives, which are very these very complicated securities that uh, ex exacerbated the, the, the business uh, and financial crisis. But all in all, there weren't all that many, and there were a number of hedge fund people who said 
these mortgage securities, mortgage-backed securities, which were at the core of the housing boom, uh, are going to collapse in value. And they bet against them, and they made, they made a lot of money. But even with all these exceptions, the vast consensus shared by mainstream economists, by business executives, by bankers, and by regulators was that we had entered a period of much less instability, and as a result of that, uh, we didn't have to be as care. We, because the world was less risky, it, to some extent, we could take more risks. Where was your thinking pre-bust? Well, uh, I would like to claim uh, that I saw it all coming. I did <laughs> not. At the end of the 90s, I was one of many people who said about the stock market, the dot-com boom, this cannot go on. This is completely crazy. Uh, and so I called that. And I did write a couple of articles, uh, columns, saying the housing market looks like it's out of sync, mm -hmm. that its prices have gone too high. But these were tentative columns. I also presented the opposite point of view that said, quoting housing experts, no, these prices are, are sustainable and stable. But even if I had been more emphatic, what I did not see, and I have to say neither did Alan Greenspan or Ben Bernanke and a whole bunch of people who are a lot smarter than I did am, what I did not see was the kind of chain reaction, that the housing market would collapse, that that would bring down uh, the, the prices of these mortgage-backed securities, that the mortgage-backed securities were then held by a large number of financial institutions and people would not know whether they were solvent or not. So they would, there would be a kind of rush away from lending to established financial institutions that would create this lending crisis in the financial system whereby normal channels of lending were became clogged. So you had this kind of, um, th again, this domino effect, and I didn't see that at all coming. Uh, you know, uh, it has me thinking, Steve, uh, <laughs> what happens next? I mean, if we didn't see this this coming. Well, not, and not only what happens next, but uh, how do you even recognize there are a few canaries in the coal mine, to use John's term, and there, there's always people out there predicting disaster or success. Absolutely, so, yeah. How do, you, how, do you, how do you recognize those people? and, and and then, and now, how well, do we... I, I, the answer is, I really don't know. I, I think, though, that there is a lesson here that people don't want to hear, but which I think has really been a lesson of the post-World War II period. And that is that there is a great contradiction at the core of democratic, and I don't mean democratic party, I mean dem democracy, hmm. democratic economic policy. And that is that the quest and the goal of economic policy in our society and in most democracies is to create as much prosperity for as many people for as long as possible. People want economic growth forever. They want to get living standards rising forever. They want prosperity to be a permanent condition. And our economic policies really strive to do that. But when we strive to do that and when we succeed, we actually create the seeds of our undoing because people become so optimistic that they become reckless. They become complacent and careless. And this has happened several times in the post-World War II period. It happened in the 1960s when economists came, uh, came and said, we can manage the business cycle. And by lowering interest rates or raising interest rates, by increase or, de or decreasing budget deficits, we can stimulate or restrain the economy, and we can get rid of recessions. And the only thing they got rid of was, they, they didn't get rid of the recessions. What they did is they just created inflation. And then we had uh, rising inflation from the end of the mid-60s, really, to the end of the 70s and early 80s, which was tremendously destabilizing for the, uh, the, the economy. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happened in the post um, the disinflation period that began in the early 1980s. We thought that the Federal Reserve had solved the problem of creating constant growth and that we weren't going to have any recessions. And so I've argued the very unpopular uh, and uh, a, I would say anti-political view is that we ought to be more tolerant of recessions, that if we have more frequent but milder recessions, they may help us avoid these less frequent but really terrifying and destructive economic convulsions of the type we're having now. And what does that mean in real terms? I, you know, I, when you look back at, w at what economic growth really was, it, it wasn't like we were growing like gangbusters. You know. 
three and a half percent during the Clinton years or the Reagan years. Less and also, Dad, what, what does it mean in terms of unemployment? What would be a tolerable recession as your friend? No, I would, I recession? would say, you know, you go to six, seven, even eight percent unemployment. Nobody likes this, but it is a lot better than having nine or ten percent unemployment mm -hmm. for now over two years with forty percent of, as I mentioned earlier, forty percent of the unemployed six months or more. Uh, if you're out of the labor market, you're losing skills, you're losing contacts, uh, you're losing credibility. So it becomes much more difficult for people to get jobs or lease jobs that are anywhere near uh, the, the, the incomes that they lost. And so it's, it's a choice. In my view, we have to acknowledge we live in, in an imperfect uh, world and we have to deal with it the best we can and not try to create a utopia in the economy, which is so far as proven impossible. How, how has this shaken your confidence in our ability to predict? Quite a bit because, um, and I have to say I blame professional and particularly academic economists for being out to lunch. Um, they, in their models, really did not incorporate financial instability into the business cycle. If you look at your standard introductory textbook in economics, you do not find economic models that describe what happened to the United States in 2007 and 2008. Uh, there's just not a central place in the theory up until then. I called, I won't name him, but I called a very well-known economist who has written a fabulously successful economics textbook. And I, I said to him, don't you think you have something missing here, that you really haven't paid attention, enough attention to what's going on in the economy? And he said, no, not at all. And he called me back a day or two later and he said, well, maybe you're right. This is the kind of denial an economist, the, 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 this was, I made this call in the early phases of the crisis before it was as severe as it became. It became so severe and the, the lapses are so obvious that now most economists are admitting this. But uh, it, I, I, I think that, um, that the big casualty here is not, as a conventional wisdom would hold it, capitalism, because capitalism has been regulated really since the 1930s and it will continue to be regulated. The real casualty here is our faith in, in, in economics and economists and their ability to understand and predict what the economy is going to do. Robert Samuelson, thank you. Steve, before we sign off, in about 20 seconds, can you give us a quick preview of the next issue of the quarterly? Well, we'll have a cover story on the future of American cities with some uh, wonderful pieces by Tom Vanderbilt and uh, Vitold Rubchinsky and other notable uh, observers of the city scene, questions about um, can you really have a city that lacks industry, for instance, and uh, a whole bunch of interesting questions like that. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, the book is The Great Inflation available in bookstores and online. And uh, here's the latest issue of the Wilson Quarterly. We'll return next week with another edition of Dialogue. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Radio and Television. Our host Twitter feed is twitter.com slash John Malevsky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.